<laughs> oh my goodness. Go ahead. Go ahead. You can sit down. Oh. Okay. We're back. The headless YouTuber doing headless planty things with her trusty pug pudge today. I feel like he hasn't been in a proper intro in so long but he saw me take my camera out. He was like, I'm ready. Uh, so anyway, we are back and today we will be finishing the discussion about no drainage potting. So I just wanna first say thank you guys so much for the incredible response to the first video that went up. So I posted part one 10 days ago and it has 10,000 views. You guys are wild, <laughs> wild. I'm actually pretty close to like the real time where you would watch this video because I filmed this entire video already. I think I invested like five or six hours over multiple days uh, to get the video done. And then I was just watching the footage and it was just a train wreck. I'm actively seeking out uh, getting my ADHD thing under control just because it's been so bad lately. I've mentioned this in a previous video. I think it was the most apparent maybe in my video that went up about glowing up seven plants and I'll throw the thumbnail up right now. That was about three and a half hours of filming time for about a one hour video. And there was a lot of like laughter because I do, I try and laugh at myself if I can, but I did have to walk away a few times because I just, couldn't get my words under control, even my body. I was just like, I wanted to jump out of my body. So I just feel like filming is getting a little bit more difficult on some days. So I, I am going to try and handle that. Thanks to someone who reached out to me on Instagram. We had just this, the most amazing conversation and it like brought me to tears and I'm just, I just feel like I'm ready. Sorry you guys, I got an 86 pudge because his, his snoring is just a little bit distracting, buddy. Oh, he just gets really worked up when I take the camera out. Yeah, so anyway, it is Wednesday. This video goes up on Saturday and I haven't filmed in this way in so long. Like I am pretty far ahead of the filming game, but I promised this video was gonna go out on Saturday and I'm going to deliver. So I'm refilming the entire thing. I have taken notes from my first round of filming and I'm hoping this time is gonna just go a little bit smoother and I'm aiming for it to be no longer than an hour and 15 minutes long. But I just, I do want it to be comprehensive. I have gone through the comments and the messages about my first video. So I'm going to cover pretty much every question that came in um, on the first video in this video. So just to let you guys know, I won't be able to film this all in one go. I'm going to be filming today and either tonight or tomorrow just because I've got uh, an appointment. I have errands to run and then an Instagram live this evening. So I need to prep for that. I think that what I'm gonna do is film the first half of this video today. And I wanted to do it out here because I feel like I haven't filmed out here in forever and I sort of kind of miss this natural light. And then either tonight or tomorrow, I'll finish the second half of this video. The first half is basically just going to be me showing you a few of the plants that I'm going to highlight that are in no drainage potting. I'm going to show you all the different kinds of combinations of no drainage amendments that you can use in vessels. I'll try and narrow down my favorites and maybe why I like them or go into why I like the combinations of each. Again, just trying to make this as fast and efficient as possible. I am going to try and cut out any of my blabbing like I'm doing right now. So like I said, uh, I'm gonna go over all of the substrates that I'm using in no drainage potting and I'm gonna go through each of them one by one. I do have an example for every single one of them except for one and that is Pawn and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later. So the first one I'm gonna show you is my Alocasia Silver Dragon in soil. It's very rare that I have a soil so dense. Um, oh my gosh, one thing I forgot about filming out here is this glare. So I have to hold it at an angle a little bit so that you can see it, but I'm gonna have soil everywhere. So this is a much more dense soil than I would normally use for my aeroids, but I just find that Alocasia's I just find that alocasias love it and uh, they do really well. I repotted this one in my repot and chat that I did with Alice and it's already 
just pushing out so many new roots. I think I did this one. Yeah, I did this one with her. And it's a newer transplant. It's only been a couple weeks and the root growth is crazy. So I am going to talk a little bit about this later in the video, but I highly recommend using no drainage potting for your alocasias. If you have an alocasia, you might know by now that they are just very rooty plants. Like the ratio of roots to leaves sometimes is just so like skewed. There's so many roots and then you'll have like one little leaf. So no drainage potting has been kind of a game changer for my alocasias. Um, this is one thing that you can do with no drainage potting is just straight aeroid soil. The next one I wanted to talk about is just purely using pawn, but I've talked about this in a few other videos and I just have stopped using straight pawn as it is. Um, Lechuza pawn brand, not homemade pawn, but just straight pawn. And that is because of how dense it is. I don't like how dense it is. It's very heavy. It gets super compacted. I find that roots tend to rot um, in straight pawn because it's so heavy. So I've been adding amendments to it to just lighten it up uh, being perlite and leka. You can do pawn with straight passive hydro, but it just keep in mind that it is a very dense mix and I, I personally recommend mixing some amendments in it to lighten it up. So then this brings me to my next plant. This is a, um, I keep wanting to say it's a Hoya Paradoxa. This is a Ripsalis Paradoxa. Why did I wear green today? Try not to mind the fact you can barely see through this vessel because of the algae. I will talk about algae later in this video as well. But yeah, I don't have any perlite mixed into this pond because this has actually been potted in here for quite some time. I think that I potted this before I started adding perlite to my pond. So I did have Leka on me, so I did add some Leka up at the top and there's not really any at the bottom, but there is some up here. But honestly, this plant has done super well in it. Besides the algae, you can see some new root growth and it's just been really, really happy. There's like lots of new growth coming from it. I've chopped this maybe three times for friends and I think my mom. So I th it would have been a lot bigger or bushier by now, but I did remove two stems from it and then I chopped one of my longest ones to propagate, to put back in here, and then also to give to a friend. So um, yeah, my Ripsalis, pretty much all of my Ripsalis are in no drainage potting. I find them to be very, very thirsty plants. They kind of enjoy the extra water that kind of sits in there a little bit longer. I do find that this is kind of a tougher Ripsalis to root, but I rooted it straight into this substrate. I just chopped it, I let it callus, I stuck it in here, and I mean, I'm assuming it's seemingly rooted because it's been kind of a while. I think that the one that I propagated was this one right here and it's it's really in there so i do think that there's some roots but i have loved this combo the pawn and the leka i do find that the leka um in between the sort of finer substrate of the pawn it helps because it kind of inserts a few air pockets in here whereas when the choose upon is just sitting all on top of each other it's just so heavy because it's the same grade and there's not a ton of air pockets in between lechuza pawn not like it would be if you added something like leka so this is another combination next up is big mama mikan she's very thirsty i haven't watered her since the last time that i filmed my week of plant to do's but I just watered so it's quite heavy. I did mention this in my part one video that uh, she started in soil. She was in no drainage, but she was in soil. And I just find this plant to be very, very thirsty. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna move it to passive hydro and just see how she does. And she didn't skip a beat. So very rooty in here. I opted for Leka and Perlite down at the bottom and then Pawn up at the top. This was the original substrate down here. And then as the plant grew, um, I had to just top it with, with more Leka. So that's why there's not any Perlite up at the top, but there's some down here at the bottom. But this is another combination that you can do, Leka, Perlite, and Pawn. I just really like this combination of substrates together. I just find that all of the different 
shapes and grades of the perlite the leca and the pawn is just it gives you so many different air pockets within the vessel i find that this combination is probably my most frequently used uh, i just like how many air pockets are in here like it's kind of hard to see but like right here is a good example there's like a big old air pocket here because there's like two pieces of coarse perlite and then leca that got wedged there so pawn can't get through so there's one little air pocket there's air pockets here again from the leca and the perlite whereas if you have something like straight pawn you can see that there's really not many air pockets um and if there are there it's just very 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 small but this thing is so freaking heavy the next time that i repot this i think what i'll do is probably do leca down at the bottom and then do very coarse perlite and pawn mixed together like a lot more perlite this time because i do think that this is a little bit pawn heavy uh it looks like i might have just like topped it with with pawn which is why you don't see any perlite or leca up here but yeah that's another combination you can do the next one is a plant that I have grown to love so much. Uh, this was the Hoya Abovada that I brought home from California. I actually, I think I repotted it in that video and it was just a bunch of single stems that didn't have any new growth points yet. It was just kind of asleep and living its life. But uh, I did repot it and it has just done so well since then. Like, is this not the cutest thing? This one's gonna be my thumbnail. Let me just pause for a second. Thumbnail. No, I don't like the leaning. How about, how about like this? Thumbnail. This is me trying to be cute. First off, thank you to everybody who left me comments on my week of plant to-dos. I think it was that video about spraying my Hoyas with the Miracle Grow Orchid Spray. Game changing. It's amazing. All of my Hoyas are like waking up. It's like, I guess that's just what they needed it like i've been giving them uh liquid gold leaf and cow mag and they're just like meh and the second that i gave it the orchid spray it's just like we're alive <laughs> this one has just grown so much like this is brand new this is brand new this is brand new this um all of this is brand new these this one like it's it's like a totally new plant it's crazy it's so much bigger and there's so many new leaves coming in like that little dude there this one here oh and look at this little fella in the back went off on a tangent this is my Hoya Abovada. I do have this one in a different kind of mix. This one has very, very chunky grade perlite down at the bottom and then just straight soil. There's not a ton of amendments in here. It is a little bit more dense than my aeroid soil. There's not a ton of perlite. There's not a ton of bark in here. I don't really know what my thought process was in terms of doing a more chunky mix, but it seems to like it. Like it's got all these brand new roots here. Um, I don't know if this is everyone's experience with the, with this plant, but this thing is so dramatic when it's thirsty. It gets so wrinkly and crinkly, so I am glad that I opted for a denser soil because I don't have to water it as much. You do just have to be careful when you are using soil with not a ton of amendments because you have to make sure that your conditions are just right, meaning just give it enough light, make sure it's not in a cold, damp place, and your plant will photosynthesize. It will use the water in the vessel. But yeah, otherwise has not had a problem at all living in this substrate i am really loving this super super chunky perlite because look at this like massive air pocket right here you can see like how much space there is between the vessel and the perlite down at the bottom and just even in between all of these little pieces so much air in there so i just find that that's really helpful if you're going to opt for something like a clear vessel aeration is just so key Next up is one of my pride and joys. I can't even believe how huge this thing is. This one started as a little tiny plant in a four inch pot. I think it had two leaves that were probably around this big, a little bit smaller, I think. But some of these new leaves have just been crazy. Uh, don't mind that it has spider mites right now. I think you might be able to see the webbing in there. I've treated this thing like three times and they keep coming back and that's why you can see these little spots maybe but 
not worried. Um, I'm just gonna have to do another round of treatment, but there's a new leaf coming and uh, just overall very happy. I have it in a very, very mossy soil mix. So it's actually more moss than soil. So there's moss, soil, perlite, leca, and I think that's about it. So I do opt for this mix when I'm either rehabbing something or I'm trying to reroot something. I think it just really loves the moss and then the added amendments add some air pockets in there. Perlite can retain some nutrients and overall I do really love using this mix. I can't remember which plant I would have done this mix with more recently that uh, I was rehabbing, but it's kind of my go-to when something already has a decent amount of soil roots or moss roots, but it's not quite ready to be like transplanted straight into aeroid soil and I just want to create a more robust root system. This would be something that I would reach for pretty much all the time. I love this guy so much. Such a big boy. Next one up is a Florida Beauty. This one started as a one leaf cutting and I do believe I was rooting it straight into moss. This one has just been such a robust grower for me. This one doesn't look like it's gonna be variegated. Hmm. Oh no. <laughs> we'll have to see. I've been so lucky with this plant that it's just given me like no issue with reverting leaves or anything. So I don't know, I don't see any variegation on this leaf like I usually do when it's emerging, but who knows, it really, it could be variegated. Anyway, this one I have in a mixture of LECA and soil. This one is one of the newer transplants in here, but it already is pushing out the fuzziest, juiciest root and is just doing really well. I didn't really have any doubts about this transplant just because I've, I think I've already transplanted this twice or repotted this twice and every single time it's just been such a champ. I really, really love the hardiness of this plant, but I opted for this mix because I did find that this one was a little bit thirstier. I used to have it straight in moss I think it was in moss and like cocoa husk and oh my gosh this thing was just consuming water like like it was competing and I just knew that when I repotted it into a more permanent vessel that I wanted to do something a little bit chunkier something that could retain more water but yeah this one did not skip a beat whatsoever so I do find that I use this mix pretty often just looking up at my shelf I can already see one two three four, five, six, and probably more, seven. Seven plants that have this combination of leca and soil. So yeah, this is another combo that you can give a try. This looks delicious. I don't know if I've shown this on my channel before, but this is my Philodendron Squamaqual. It's one of my newer acquisitions. I got this one locally from um, someone in our Facebook group. I do find that it's a slower rooter. I got this one probably, I wanna say like two months ago, and I'm only now starting to see like a single root, you're not gonna be able to see it. It's like so camouflaged in here, but I am seeing one little root now, which thank goodness, because I've heard kind of nightmare stories about rooting serpents and rooting squamic quals. And I was like, oh gosh, good riddance. But uh, here we are, alive and kicking, hasn't lost any leaves yet since I brought it home, but I did treat this as a rehab, even though it wasn't sold as a rehab, I just, the root system wasn't very robust. I knew that I wanted way more roots than it had before I got it into something permanent. So I opted for Leka down at the bottom and then a very, very chunky moss mix up at the top. So this one has cocoa husk, perlite, moss, and then Leka down at the bottom. So the reason that I added amendments to this moss is because again aeration people told me that this one was a little bit more finicky to root people had been dealing with root rot and stem rot and i just wanted to be able to keep an eye on it and make sure that there was enough air in here i could have done just straight moss but i just feel like the addition of the cocoa husk and the perlite was a good call because again you can see so many little air pockets in here. Perlite can retain nutrients, so I definitely wanted to add perlite. Overall, hasn't really thrown a fit that much. Um, these leaves haven't yellowed any more than it was, I guess, when I brought it home. I think the only thing I've noticed was like 
the tip of this is like getting a little bit more crispy or whatever. It's like losing its like green color, but I, I'm not really sure what that's all about. This one is a fun little combo and I just find that pretty much any plant that I put into this mix has rehabbed really, really well. This one I did show in my part one video. This is the largest plant that I have growing in no drainage right now. I'm gonna put it down on the floor. This leaf is so pretty. So uh, this is a Monstera Albo, obviously. I have cut this one down already twice. It, I think if I didn't cut it, it would definitely be taller than I am now and I just could not manage a plant that tall. So it has been chopped, but yeah, this one has been living in no drainage ever since I brought it home. This is in the world's largest vessel. This one is also in a combo of, oh God, so heavy. Leca and moss. This one does not have added perlite to the moss, but I did add some orchid bark to it. But this thing is just, it's just loved life in no drainage, honestly. And I feel like a lot of people would be very against growing something like an elbow in no drainage potting because of kind of how finicky they can be. But I do find that elbows are a lot easier to grow and root than the Monstera Thai constellation. These are all pretty much brand new roots and you can see it's like really rooted into this moss here. Lots of Leca roots down at the bottom. And I need to put this plant down. It's so heavy. My, why does my hand look so tiny? It looks like a little Barbie hand. Yeah, this combination has just done wonders for me. I love the fact that the Leca down at the bottom just, you can fill to about halfway and cover the Leca. It just wicks all of that water up into the moss and just gets it nice and hydrated. And it's really easy. Honestly, I just find no drainage potting to actually be easier for watering than plants with drainage holes and I will go into that later as well. Okay, I've got two plants left to show you here. So this one is my Philodendron Majestic that is on a half moon pole. This one is in a combination of Leca, Perlite, Pawn, and then Moss up at the top. So not much different than what I showed you before. The only difference with this one is that I have added this moss up at the top, mostly to stabilize this moss pole, but also when you add moss, it kind of creates like a barrier and then you just create this little ecosystem down here. You just wanna make sure to not pack it too tight because you do want air to be able to like move around. You don't want it to just kind of become this thing where no water can evaporate or anything. I do use this combination a lot. I top, I would say maybe 80% of my plants with moss because I find that it deters fungus gnats because this top layer here gets really dry fast, especially if it's living outside of a greenhouse and you're not spraying it that often. And gnats just don't like it. They like damp conditions. They like things that are wet. So when they kind of like come across this dry layer of moss, they're like, oh, I don't want that. Yeah, this is not much different than any of the combos that I showed you previously. And you can add moss to the top of any of those combinations as well. I do it all the time and yeah, it works really well for me. The last one I'm gonna show you is my little Hoya elliptica. This is more of a rooting rehab potting situation. This is not something that I would ever opt for long-term really. Um, and that's just using straight perlite, whether it's fine grade or coarse grade, doesn't really matter. Perlite is just a great rooting substrate because of how porous it is, how aerated it is, it's so light. I really have not met a plant that did not appreciate being in perlite. Not that I can remember anyway. So this is a newer acquisition, but this one was given to me in just straight perlite and I've had it in here since I've gotten it and I don't really plan on moving it out anytime soon. I really wanna see this cup fill up with roots first and then I will transplant it. But yeah, perlite is also a great option and no drainage if you're working with plants that are either rehabbing, rerooting. I think I rehabbed most of my ties previously in perlite and they loved it. And then the second that I moved it to like a permanent substrate, it was like, oh, f it all. So yeah, perlite is great for those reasons, but I have actually never grown plants long-term in perlite just because I find that it dries out a lot faster. So uh, I just, I tend to not 
really go that direction. But I do know people do it. I know they can grow in perlite long term. I guess I've just never wanted to do it. Why was that so exhausting? <laughs> Such a crazy dog. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Pudge is upset with me. Ugh. How do people wear necklaces? I've been wearing this. I've been trying to wear this like nonstop to get used to it. Uh, my sister got this for me. It just has a P on it, but like it always turns to where like the clasp is in the front and then it like chokes me when I sleep. I'm just not made for this life. Today we are just going to get into the nitty gritty of all of the like little details that go into no drainage potting. I do want, I, I don't want anyone to come out of this video feeling overwhelmed. I feel like on this channel, I really like dumb things down because I'm the kind of person that needs something explained to me like I'm five years old. So I don't really get into a lot of like the scientific parts of plant growing um, besides talking about like different nutrients and stuff, which I feel like is very surface level. I'm just kind of like a, let's, let's talk about this simply. I do have a lot of things I wanna cover. I want to cover how I water, how I fertilize. I want to address salt buildup, algae. I wanna talk about the pros and cons, where I get my vessels, um, acclimating plants to no drainage potting, plants to avoid in no drainage potting, um, how I choose my amendments and a lot of it has very simple answers, but I do get these questions a lot, so I wanted to talk about it. I think that where I'm gonna start is how to water because this is the most frequently asked question. So I'm gonna grab a few plants to show you how I water. I'm gonna try and grab plants that have different combinations, although I'm not sure if all of them are gonna need to be watered, but I will try my best. So we're gonna move over to the plant table and I'll just get started. The first one that I want to water today is my Ripsalis Paradoxa Minor. If you're not familiar with how this plant normally looks, you would think it probably looks fine, but it's actually very, very, very thirsty. And you can see how thirsty it is because all of these little ridges that you see along here, like, I'm gonna drop it. <laughs> like this one right here, these ridges, they should not be there. Normally they are really nice and plump, and they're a little bit harder to bend, but yeah, this this thing has just been depleted of water. So I thought this would be a good one to highlight um, in terms of watering because when I have a plant this large that absorbs so much water, I'm actually gonna be watering it a little bit more than I normally would if it was just a regular watering. And that is because the water is gonna move into the plant and then you're not gonna be left with pretty much anything in your reservoir. So uh, I am going to water this a little bit more. Don't be frightened when you see a lot of water down here, but I'm just gonna show you how I water. This thing is also growing like crazy. So I'm also gonna be fertilizing and today I am using liquid gold leaf. So I guess I can also talk about fertilizing with no drainage pots. Fertilizing in no drainage is not much different for me anyway than plants with with drainage. Try and ignore Paj walking in the background. That's his way of signaling me that he wants to go out. He just taps everywhere. But yeah, a lot of the fertilizers that we're using for our aeroids, they're not as acidic as like a fertilizer that you would use, let's say for your vegetables or your herbs in your garden. So I really haven't had that many issues with like salt buildup or like over fertilization. And also a part of that is because I'm only fertilizing at like a quarter strength every time. I, I feel like there's probably someone else out there that can that's a little bit more knowledgeable in terms of what's actually going on in the substrate with your fertilizer and with salt buildup. But just for me, I haven't noticed any drawback to my fertilization um, regimen and all the fertilizers that I've been using. And that's pretty much all I have to say about that is just regular fertilizing when your plant is growing, not fertilizing at full strength on what shows on the bottle. And that's pretty much it. So anyway, I have my fertilizer water in my spray bottle. So what I do when I fertilize is I will first just use regular water to water it and then I will go in with the fertilizer water after. I'm first gonna just go kind of along the edges if I can 
and water is going to slowly travel down just depending on how aerated your soil is. This one is a little bit denser so it's going to take a little bit more time to travel all the way down but I am going to water a lot more than what I've already added. If you're noticing that your water is just kind of spilling very quickly down the edges of the pot, your soil is probably hydrophobic, so you should probably change that out. Or you can poke some holes with like a chopstick and just aerate it a little bit. But also the soil will do its thing. It'll eventually disperse that water throughout the soil. Don't worry about all of the soil looking dark like this just kind of let it do its thing. If I am noticing though that there's like a big pocket where nothing is draining down, so I'll take something like this and just kind of go down the edge like that and just move things around and then water. And you can see down here my water line is covering about half of the LECA. So I'm not this calculated every time I water. Honestly, once you get to know the plants that are in no drainage and once you're using no drainage for, um, I don't know, like a couple months, it just kind of becomes second nature and you don't really think about it. This is liquid gold leaf. It looks very yucky, but it's great fertilizer. It smells like <laughs> though. I'm going to be fertilizing with about this much water. So typically I would wait until all of the water has finished traveling down and then I will go in and water the entire thing with fertilizer. I just find that once the soil is already saturated, the fertilizer water doesn't travel so quickly down the vessel and it can really get saturated and absorbed in that soil where the roots are and you're not really wasting a lot of fertilizer. So this is what it would look like. You'll notice that there are still quite a few pockets of dry soil but i am not going to worry about that at all the wicking characteristics of the leca is going to move that water into the soil the roots will absorb water in the soil and you'll eventually see that maybe in a day or so all of this should be wet and the soil will disperse that water without you needing to make sure that it's actually wet. I think that's one way that people, I guess, overwater with plants in no drainage is they feel like all of it should be saturated because unlike using pots with drainage, you can just run it under the sink until all of that soil is saturated and then just let it drain down from the bottom and then you're done. So with no drainage, um, you just have to keep in mind that the water isn't going anywhere. It's gonna stay in the vessel. You just have to let the LECA and the soil do its thing. And if you are noticing that after your plant has plumped up, that there's still a ton of water left, you can easily just drain it. But if your plant is in a very warm place, if it's in a place with a lot of light, again, I wouldn't worry about it too, too much because it's eventually going to use that water. And your roots down here that's closer to the LECA has more water roots, LECA roots, and is used to being submerged in water. Whereas maybe the roots up here are not as like tough and resistant to like rotting in water as these roots down here. In my experience, it really has not been an issue the only thing you want to avoid is your water should not be sitting where the soil line is. This is kind of like your safe space over here. If you are trying no drainage for the first time, I would not recommend using straight soil. I would recommend using something like LECA or um, perlite, like coarse perlite down at the bottom. This is a great combination if you're kind of just starting to learn how to pot with no drainage, but I promise you it just, it becomes second nature after you get used to it for a while. All right, next plant on the list is this Hoya abovada. I just love seeing it. When I first realized that I wanted to get into Hoyas, this was one of my number one wishlist plants and I'm just, I'm not disappointed at all. I've said this before, but I don't do a ton of research on Hoyas and I don't even really know the names of most of the Hoyas that I own, but I kind of like that I don't know that much about Hoyas because I don't really know what 
are trendy Hoyas. I don't know what are like considered rare Hoyas. I don't know anything about Hoyas. All I know is that I like what I like and it just feels, it feels kind of nice to really truly just collect Hoyas because I like it and not because some influencer has it or some big YouTuber suggested it's gonna be like the newest like trendy Hoya. Like I just collect Hoyas purely for what my eyeballs like to see and that's it. I, re I just really like that part of this new like Hoya ownership thing. But anywho, this plant is very thirsty. You can see the kind of crinkling on here. Oh there, you can see the texture. It doesn't normally look like this, but when it's thirsty, it just, yeah, becomes super, super flat and soft and crinkly. As a reminder, this one is in very, very coarse asteroid size perlite and soil. So this is just regular water. This one's a little tricky because of how bushy it is. So I think I'm actually gonna be using a squirt bottle for this. If you haven't seen it in my other videos, these are the bottles that I use. They're just like the medical grade plastic bottles and I really love them. I used to use these bottles to water like all of my small plants and my no drainage vessels, but ever since I got the sprayer, it's just so much more efficient. It's a lot faster. So I, I just use these for like the teeny tiny Hoyas in my cabinet or like plants like this where it's really hard to get in there with like a cup without spilling everywhere. So I'm just gonna take my regular water and I'm going to first go along the sides of the vessel. You can see it's slowly starting to travel down. This one is also in a slightly denser mix than my aeroid mix, so it is taking a little bit longer to get down there, but you can see it's it's moving, it's going. Because this is a thirstier Hoya, again, like I explained with the Ripsalis uh, Paradoxa Minor, these big leaves are going to just take in a lot of that water and whatever is in here is not gonna be in here anymore. It's gonna be in the leaves. So this is still not enough water for it. So I, I think what I usually do is cover pretty much most of the perlite and now I'm gonna go in with my fertilizer water. The water is all the way up to here. I'm gonna let the water move into the leaves. Yeah, I will show you what this looks like tomorrow. And it'll definitely look a lot more plump than this. This one is in Leka and Pond. I know what this plant feels like and looks like when it's really, really filled with water. And it does not look like this, but it is not as thirsty as my Ripsalis Paradoxa Minor. So I'm not gonna be adding that much more extra in the reserve because again, keep in mind, water from the vessel is obviously gonna move through the plant. And if you water just enough for the plant to get the water it needs, you're not gonna be left with anything in here and you're gonna have to be watering constantly. So keep in mind that these roots are more acclimated to sitting in water. So it's fine if you've got a little reserve of water at all times. There are some plants that I feel like are more drought tolerant where you could just water exactly what it needs and let it be dry for a little bit of time, but just for your own sanity, especially in something like pond that I feel dries out so fast, you can add a little bit more. That's what the reserve is for. That is how passive hydro works. You shouldn't always have to constantly be filling your vessels. You should be able to just leave a little bit of water left for the plant to take as it needs. For this one, I am going to be watering what I normally water plus a tiny, tiny bit extra. This one put out some new growth this little guy here, but it's kind of been a little while since I've seen any more new growth. So I am not gonna be fertilizing this one this time. If anything, I'll probably just add a little bit of Marfil, but nothing too strong.
If this plant was not super thirsty, this is pretty much how high I would fill it. I know it's kind of impossible to see because of the algae, but the water goes to about right here. But since it is thirsty and I know a lot of that water is going to be depleted to move into the plant, I'm going to be adding a little bit more extra so that I don't need to fill this one again right away. And then I'm just literally gonna add a teeny tiny splash of Marfil in here. Half Marfil, half water, even more on the water side. And I'm not gonna add this whole thing. I'm literally just gonna add a teeny tiny bit just to get some extra nutrients in there. So here's where my water line is right now. It is right up here and I'm feeling good about it. I think by tomorrow it should probably be down to about here or like a little bit higher. So I guess we'll see tomorrow. I love this plant so much. It's just been so good to me ever since the repot. I chopped this one for my mom. I gave her two cuttings for her birthday and this wasn't even the top cut. I gave my top cut to my mom. That's how much I love her because if you know me, you know I am a top cut girl. I always want the top cut, but this is the bottom cut. So this was the first leaf that came from the middle of the plant and it's a pretty good size. Got it on a half moon moss pole and it's already pushing out some new growth up at the top. But this one is in a mixture of Leca, Perlite, and Pawn. And then I have moss at the top to stabilize the moss pole and just kind of trap in some extra humidity in there. This one has also been a thirsty plant for me and I think it's because it's a hybrid. Hybrids have that hybrid vigor and they grow so much. And I find that it uses a lot more water than a philodendron like a Milano Chrysum. So yeah, I just watered this one maybe five days ago and there's already no water left in the vessel, but these leaves are nice and plump. They don't even look like they need to be watered, but I do want to get something in this vessel for the reserve for when the plant does need it. I think one thing that I've observed over the years is that when you have a manageable amount of plants that you can just really baby them as they need it, if you don't allow your plants to go a period of like drought and not get to the point where it's floppy and curled and stuff and you're just constantly giving it like the right amount of water whenever it needs it, it grows so much better because I find that when you let a plant get very limp and soft, every single week. It does go through a certain amount of stress. It pushes out extra floral nectaries. A sign of stress on plants I find has been pushing out EFN. In general, if you can be a little bit more regular with your watering, I just find that your, your plant is going to be a lot happier in the long run. This is one that I am super, super babying right now and for good reason. It is so beautiful. So I'm going to get some water into this reserve and I will show you how much I add just on a normal watering. Since this one is pushing out new growth I am going to be fertilizing as well so I'm just gonna add the water first and on a d-shaped pole the cool thing is you can add it straight from the top and let it run down into the bottom so I think I'll actually show you that now and uh, kind of show you how this cool thing works I showed this on my Instagram stories not too long ago I don't know if you can see it but there are some nice fuzzy roots forming in this d-shaped pole and this is like a new level of satisfaction. I just, this is amazing because now you can fertilize the pole and get these roots nice and hydrated and fertilized and just, I cannot wait to see the growth on this thing um, like in the next year. So anywho, I'm gonna stop fangirling over my plants and just show you how this works. Sorry, I gotta take you kind of far away because it's more, it's on the larger side. So what I'm doing is just taking my regular water and I'm just gonna water straight into this pole from the top. I'm gonna give you a view of the pot so you can see the water traveling from the moss pole into the pot. I don't know if you can see this water line rising, but it is coming up, up, up. 
I can hear that Lekka and substrate moving around in there. My rule of thumb is to cover a fourth of your substrate, not the fourth of the vessel size, the fourth of your substrate level. So this is about a quarter, half, three quarters, and then all the way. So it's a little bit higher than I normally would want it to be, but some of that is gonna move into the plant. So I think maybe by tomorrow it should be right about at the quarter line, but I am gonna add a tiny bit of fertilizer into this moss pole, not too much because my water line is a little on the higher side. This one is all done and that is what a like a routine watering looks like on a plant that's not super thirsty and just needs more water added to the reserve. Next on the table is my Anthurium vitarifolium. I actually find this Anthurium to be a very heavy drinker. So I've opted to do a tall vessel for this one and that is because I can add more Lekka down at the bottom to have a higher reserve and then have more substrate than if I were to use something a little bit more shallow. So that's something I wanted to address. If you know you have a plant that loves to drink, taller vessels are amazing or even just larger vessels. I know that like a rule of thumb that is always preached in this community is like, your vessel can't be too big for the plant. And to a certain extent, yes, that's true, but you have to keep in mind what plant you're working with and the conditions you're giving it. If I put this in a much larger vessel than this one now, I wouldn't be too worried about it because I know that it's getting a controlled amount of light, um, controlled temperature because it is in my plant room. I just know the right amount of water to give it so that all of the water that's in that vessel, no matter how big it is, the roots will be able to use it. Also, this could be like a totally separate video, but another part of overwatering is not having healthy roots. So you could be watering very, very little, but if your root system is crap, it's not gonna be taking in water anyway, um, especially if you've got rotted roots, dead roots, or just not healthy roots. So the root system health is also very important in terms of watering. But going back to what I was saying, if you've got a thirsty plant, opt for a taller vessel like this. And I also get all of my vessels, all of my clear glass vessels at the thrift stores. It's just so much cheaper. You're not needing to go to somewhere like Ikea, spending double the amount. Um, go to a thrift store and see what you can find. But anyway, I did water this one very recently. I actually filled the bottom all with water and it is all gone now. And this is looking nice and plump, whereas like two days ago, it was like all shriveled and curled. I actually just moved this one from my bedroom into the plant room because it wasn't doing that great in my bedroom. It's very dry in there because we do have the heater on. So yeah, it, it is, I feel like it's gonna do much better in here. What you're seeing at the top is diatomaceous earth and I do that to prevent fungus gnats. And I don't know why I've been doing so many applications because I haven't seen a fungus gnat in ages, which is good. I did want to show this in the video because I am going to also be doing a maintenance watering on this. You can see there's still a little bit of moisture down at the bottom of the soil and the top is more on the dry side. So I'm gonna be filling about a quarter of the Lekka to about a half with water. I'm also going to be doing a reapplication of systemic. I've been trying to do that with a lot of my plants as we approach thrip season here in Canada. I am fully prepared for getting thrips numerous times over the summer. It's just inevitable and I feel like I've been kind of shamed on my my YouTube. Like, oh, you use systemic and you say that you quarantine and you use all these sprays, so why do you keep getting thrips? I get thrips because thrips are bugs and they can get in the house. And I bring new plants home all the time. My methods are not 100% guaranteed. It's just, it's just part of the hobby and I get thrips. Thrips get in my house and they, that's just what it is. What you can do if you wanna just add to the reserve without getting the soil too damp is kind of tilt it at an angle if you're able to and just kind of let it drain down one of the sides so that you don't need to like water the full plant. And then just let it kind of fall down to the bottom. Water line is still a little bit low, so I'm gonna add a little bit more. If you have a sprayer, you can just direct the spray to the side of the vessel 
yeah if you have smaller plants or plants like this that can easily just be tilted over this is kind of what i do pretty often this is where my water line is it's about right here which is about a fourth of the leka so yeah this one should be good in terms of getting water when it does need more water in these leaves but i probably shouldn't have to actually water this thing like a heavy water for like another week or so let's grab our next victim this is a ficus alii and this one is one of my favorites it's a brand new leaf and it's just growing so well in ambient humidity i have this one in just straight soil the roots are very, very, very hairline. So this brings me to the next question I wanted to address. And someone asked, how do I choose which amendments to use or which substrate to use on each vessel? Because it doesn't seem like there's a pattern or I've never explained why I do it. So honestly, it's it feels like it's a complex answer, but it's really not. But the first part of it is knowing the plant. I feel like before you really do anything to a plant whether you repot or you try and like acclimate it down to room humidity if it's an import i feel like you just have to kind of get to know the plant a little bit before you like get i guess overly confident and just try and do your normal thing this is a plant that i have never had experience with before one thing that i noticed when i repotted this thing from the original nursery pot that glare is so effing annoying <laughs> sorry there's really nothing I can do about it but one thing that I noticed off the bat when I purchased this from the nursery was that the roots were so teeny tiny and when I got it out of the pot to bring it to Canada I had to take all of the soil off and I lost so many roots because of how hairline they are. I was a little bit worried about using something like passive hydro for this plant but just something in my gut kind of told me that it would be okay. I was a little bit nervous to use something like pawn or use something like leka just because I didn't know how such fine roots would do sitting underwater. I do have plants with very fine roots that do live in passive hydro like my begonia gray ghost my begonia sinbad but yeah i do have plants with roots very very similar to this that are doing just fine but again not a ton of experience or knowledge about this plant so i wanted to just give it what it knew which was soil and i tried to replicate the soil in the nursery as much as possible but add a little bit more amendment since it wasn't being potted with drainage holes so i opted for yeah just regular soil i added a little bit more perlite i think there's even a little bit of pond in there like when i'm working with pond and it like gets on the floor or it gets in this mat and it's all mixed with soil and stuff i don't try and separate it out i just throw it into my soil bin and call it a day so that's why you're seeing a little bit of pond i added my coarse perlite there's a little bit of moss in here so that is why i chose to just do soil it really just depends on the plant so I will show you an example of another plant that I have different amendments with. So this one is Leka down at the bottom and moss up at the top. And this one used to just be purely in moss, but it, again, this plant is a very thirsty plant. Sorry, I didn't even show you what it was. This is a Philodendron Plowmanii. So beautiful. Yeah, I did notice while acclimating this plant and rehabbing this plant that it just it wasn't doing that well in moss it dried out way too quickly for my watering schedule and i just felt like the addition of leka down at the bottom would help because i could just keep a reserve in there and the roots could take it up as it needed it and i could just keep adding it the only thing is that it has quickly outgrown this vessel and for a plant this large i would ideally opt for something a little bit larger than this or a little bit deeper than this this. so i do think i will be repotting this one today i wanted to do at least one repot in this video to just kind of show you a no drainage potting start to finish i'm not going to be watering this right now since i'm going to be getting it out of here but i did want to show you and kind of explain my thought process behind why i chose these substrates as a combination so while i water this guy i just i think that more can be said about i guess the thought process that goes behind choosing the right substrate or the right substrate combination for a plant for one 
I think that one of the most important things like I had mentioned is just knowing the plant knowing how much water it drinks knowing if it's a quick grower knowing if the roots tend to rot or the stem tends to rot there's like so many factors that you have to think about um, I, I feel like if you analyze it too much you can get overwhelmed but I feel like once you just know your plants you just kind of like understand what it needs so you have to make a call but even beyond that, I think it's really, really important to know what each substrate does. I think that like, especially if you're new to the hobby, you just see accounts like me that shows you, oh, this is what's in my soil mix, or these are the amendments that I use for my imports. But you can't just take that at face value and be like, oh, that's what she does, so I'm gonna do it too. It's really important that you know what perlite does, what moss does, what charcoal does, what cocoa husk does. You know which one retains moisture, which one really improves aeration. I, I think that I could probably do a totally separate video on that, like a really short one, and just highlight the key characteristics of some of the common substrates that we're using. I'm not gonna talk about it in this video just because that's go it's veering a little bit away from the topic. Knowing the plant and knowing what your amendments are doing is so important because otherwise, if you don't know what each of these things do for the plants, you're kind of just blindly adding it in because either that's what you were told that you should do or that's what you saw someone do on Instagram. Yeah, I think it's really important to do your research on kind of what the functions are of all of your substrates uh, just so that you know the right combination to put in. It's kind of like cooking, not that I can really attest to this because I can't cook, but it's like knowing, it's like spices, you know, like you know that cayenne pepper is spicy, you know that um, turmeric has a certain taste or, or pepper or salt or sugar. It's just knowing each of those flavors and what it's gonna do for the dish that you're making. That's the best comparison that I can make. So, uh, yeah, my hands are itchy. I love this plant so much. This is my smaller fillet engine, Billy Etier, and it's just crazy. Honestly, I haven't really lost any leaves on this plant. It's kind of wild. It gives so much and requires so little. So a plant like this that is just very easy going, of course I opted for no drainage. I just knew that it would not fuss at all. Billetiers have nice big fuzzy roots so I did end up doing a layer of LECA down at the bottom and actually the LECA goes to about right here. It's pretty high up and then filled it with soil and I do have a ton of LECA mixed into this soil. So this is another plant that is not super thirsty right now. The leaves feel very firm. It's nice and perky. It looks exactly the way I would want it to look after watering. But I know just knowing this plant and knowing what this substrate looks like right now, it is all dry. I just know that in a few days, this plant will show signs of needing water. So I'm just going to water it. And that brings me to my next question, which is, do you allow your vessels to dry out completely before rewatering? And the answer is not as simple as I'd hoped, but it really just depends on the plant. If you know that a plant kind of reacts badly to always having sort of damp soil, I would allow it to dry out a little bit, but this is as dry as you'd want it to be. There is literally no water left in here. I am going to be watering this regularly, even though it's not showing signs that it needs to be watered. Um, a perk of growing in no drainage is that you've essentially trained your root system to kind of allow for water to constantly be in the vessel. And because there is a new leaf, I'm also going to be fertilizing but this is the last plant that I'm going to be watering in this video. I just wanted to be able to show a good amount of plants in all different sort of like stages of, I don't know, being thirsty, being okay, just so you guys can get a good grasp of watering once you do move to no drainage, if you do try it out, which I do recommend you do, honestly. It's, I, I just, I really love growing in no drainage, but I do understand it's not for everyone. And now I'm going in with my fertilizer water. There's another question that came in that asked if my amendments are different with no drainage versus having drainage, and the answer is no. I would use all the same amendments. I would just use it differently. 
like if I had a pot with no drainage I wouldn't do something like I did with my Hoya Abovada where I put like perlite down at the bottom and then soil up at the top or sometimes I will add a thick layer of Leka down at the bottom and then do soil and the reason that I do that sometimes is because like let's say that I'm having a bad nap problem Bottom watering has helped a bit, but I am just not a bottom waterer. It takes too much time, too much effort. I just do not. I, I don't have the patience for it. On certain plants that I find gnats tend to gravitate towards, I'll do let go down at the bottom and then soil up at the top. And then I'll put it like in a little tray of water and just fill the tray with water and let the let go wick it from the bottom or I'll put it in a cash pot and then fill it with water so that I'm not having to water from the top but that's like a whole other thing I don't do it very often but to answer your question all of the amendments that I use um, are the same one thing I did want to show in this video is doing straight moss with no drainage and I don't even think I covered that in the very beginning and that's because I actually don't have many plants right now that are purely in moss with no drainage. A lot of my rehabs and propagations like this one have already moved to a permanent substrate. So uh, this is kind of one of the last ones that I have in moss. I feel like there's a good amount of people out there that are scared to use moss or just have not had good luck with moss um, and just have had things rot and honestly as much as I don't obviously want to promote the use of sphagnum moss if you have found a propagation substrate that works for you that's better than moss obviously stick to that just because collectively um, as hobbyists we are consuming a lot of sphagnum moss and if you can avoid using it I feel like you should if you already don't like it then <laughs> then don't use it but you also may not be using it correctly you can watch my sphagnum moss video I'll throw the thumbnail up I did a whole video on how to prepare it how to mix substrates into it how to water it and you can kind of get all of that information there, but I'll just quickly highlight watering specifically with sphagnum moss. When you prepare sphagnum moss, obviously you soak the brick in water, you let it absorb all that water, get nice and fluffy like this, um, and then you wring out as much water as you can because you don't want it to be like dripping water. You just want it to kind of hold on to moisture in it, but if you squeeze it no water should come out the thing though with watering is obviously you're not going to take the whole plant out re-wet the moss put it back in i have had someone dm me and ask me if that's how you do it she's like it's just taking too long to water all my, my sphagnum moss props because i have to remove it and redampen the moss and squeeze it out you don't have to do that the way I water moss is really no different than if I would water substrate like soil or perlite or pond or leka. I'm going to use a squeeze bottle because this one I did water not too long ago and I don't want to water it any more uh, than it already is. But I do want to be able to show you an example. I think that the expectation when you re-wet your moss is that it should always look exactly like this after and that's just not going to be the case it is going to be very very water heavy when you first water but it will eventually disperse throughout the rest of the moss and dry out especially if you're keeping it in a warm place with a lot of light so i first water around the edges with moss and then i just go across the top like this and that's it I let all of that water move through the moss and then it figures itself out. You don't have to wring this out, you just leave it. Just make sure that in your moss props or your plants with moss, you are giving it adequate light for enough hours in the day. All my grow lights are on for 12 hours in the day, sometimes longer if I'm in the plant room and I need the light to be on, but a minimum of 10 to 12 hours a day. Uh, this one is in my tent. It's pretty warm in there. It's getting a controlled environment, so I am not worried about this moss staying damp for too long. To be honest, I will probably have to water this, uh, I would say, in about five to six days. And also keep in mind, this is a propagation. I don't remember if there are roots in here. I don't think it's rooted. I think it's an unrooted cutting. So there's not any roots that are absorbing the water. So you're really just depending on evaporation and the warmth in whatever greenhouse you're keeping it in or wh wherever it is to just kind of dry out this moss. But um, really on a plant like this with no roots, I'm not worried about root rot obviously, but I don't want the stem to rot, but it is very calloused over. So really there's not a tremendous drawback for this moss to be a little bit on the wetter side so again you just you really have to like assess the plant assess the situation assess whatever root system or lack thereof and just make the call 
The next thing that I want to talk about is algae and I do have a dedicated video on this on my channel and I don't remember the name off the top of my head. I think it's called like no drainage potting and like algae or something like that. But yeah, watch that video if you haven't, if you are interested in learning a little bit more about like my vessels with crazy algae buildup and how I manage it or how I used to manage it anyway before my YouTube channel. Um, I just don't have time right now. Wow, this one is super, super firm. I just watered this one yesterday and I actually filled the vessel up all the way to the top because of how thirsty it was. I could literally bend these leaves in half. They were just completely limp. You can't really see because of the algae buildup, but there's no water left in this vessel because it all moved into the leaves. So I'm actually gonna repot this one on camera just because this is a little bit excessive for me in terms of algae buildup. I typically don't mind it. Algae will not harm or kill your plants. I promise you it's not going to. There's a lot of mixed feelings and opinions out there but this is just to my experience all of my plants in no drainage that have a crazy amount of algae buildup has never once shown me a sign that it was like dying because of the algae this plant has been in here for so long looking like this and i got this one as a two leaf cutting and it's given me lots of new growth i do want to kind of treat this thing a little bit though and get it into a larger vessel because i've got some roots up here that I would like to keep covered under the substrate and this is just a little bit too small for this guy now. So we are going to repot it on camera and I will answer a few more questions along the way. Here is the root system. You can see that a lot, there is some algae on the actual substrate but most of it is just really built up on the vessel itself. One of the questions I wanted to answer was, do you have to acclimate a plant to no drainage? Honestly, I I don't really see how you could really acclimate a plant to no drainage. Kind of yes and no. So many of these questions really just de depends on the plant and the situation, like if it's a new import, does it have soil roots? Does it have leka roots? Was it water rooted? If you want to learn a little bit more about transitioning plants to different substrates, I would watch my propagation video. Although there were a lot of people that did not like that video. But again, everything I talk about on this channel is stuff that works for me and has just been my experience. In terms of acclimation, let's say that I wanted to move this plant here to soil. There would be a little bit of a stress on the root system because it's used to having pond substrate and being submerged in water. And then you put it into a substrate like soil that can dry out. Water roots and soil roots are, they are different. Soil roots are resistant to water, but they're a little bit more, I would say like delicate. And they've got like these fuzzy hairs on them that like allow them to breathe underwater whereas soil roots don't have that. Sometimes you'll find that like if you transition something from water straight into soil it rots and people are like why like I, I didn't even water it that much and truly it's really not anything you did it's just the fact that the roots are are like built different than soil roots. I do chalk up a lot of it to the I guess resilience of the specimen itself or the resilience of the root system itself and then have to making sure that you're giving it the conditions that it needs to kind of make it through that transition period. If you watched my last week of plant chores, you'll see that me and Alice transitioned Aaron's Philodendron Dean McDowell from soil into passive hydro. We moved it into a lechuza pond planter and just did straight lechuza pond. And it's been about a week and a half now or close to two weeks, I think. And she's been sending us updates and it's doing really, really well. In terms of acclimation, I would say that like, let's say that you move something from water into soil. My kind of like method would be to not allow the soil to get super dry because those roots are used to being submerged in water or just being in water in general. If you notice that like a water prop, like let's say you take a water prop and you leave it out for like 30 minutes, those suckers will dry out really fast. Same thing, if you move it into soil, don't just like plop it into soil and let it dry out. I would like keep the soil a little bit more on the wetter side for 
for the first like two weeks to kind of let those roots be like, okay, we're in a new substrate. I do still have some water here and everything's okay. And then as new roots grow, it'll be acclimatized to soil. So I always explain things like I'm explaining it to a five-year-old. I'm sure there are way more people out there that could explain it better than I am, but honestly, that's just in my experience. I just try and sort of replicate the conditions that it came from during that transition period, just so that like it doesn't get shocked too much. But in terms of using no drainage, it's kind of the same concept. If you repot a plant that's in soil and you do allow that plant to like dry out between waterings, you know, I would just do the same thing with, with no drainage. I wouldn't kind of change your watering schedule so drastically. I would treat it as if it is in drainage holes, but obviously being more careful with the amount of water that you're using since it's not draining out of the bottom. I am winded and my dog is snoring like crazy. I'm gonna go wash my hands and uh, get some new pond for this. Oh my God, this pond, this old pond smells like absolute horse <laughs> Oh, I'm gonna throw up. <coughs> oh my God. I have such a sense of gathering flex. All right, this is not at all the ideal vessel for this, especially since it's in my red stuff. I like to keep all my pots in my Redsta clear vessels or just like nice vessels, but I think what I'll do is put it in here and then try and find a cover pot for this one. But it's the only one that's deep enough and large enough for this root system. The next question is plants to avoid in no drainage. I actually answered this, I think it might have been in the first video. I definitely know I talked about it, but Honestly, I have never met a plant that didn't like no drainage. I feel like all plants sort of have the capability of living happily in passive hydro. Maybe some might react a little bit more drastically or dramatically than another plant. But overall, I feel like if you are doing it right, meaning like you know how much water to add in your vessels, you're not using fertilizers that are super, super acidic. I just really don't see why any plant wouldn't like passive hydro or living in no drainage. The only real answer that I had to this question was that I wouldn't use no drainage for a plant, anything larger than like an eight inch pot. A 10 inch pot is already pretty large. That's a lot of substrate to use. I guess unless you're using one of those like rectangular planters for crawlers, but otherwise, yeah, I try and only keep my smaller plants in no drainage with the exception of the elbow, just because I don't know if you guys know this, but that plant actually doesn't belong to me. I've been caring for it for my friend Pearl and she prefers growing in no drainage because she she's just used to it and she didn't want to have to deal with drainage holes on a plant that large. So we just opted for no drainage. She had a vessel large enough and we just made it work. But otherwise for my own collection, I just would not pot like a really, really large plant in no drainage. It's usually eight inches and actually usually only six inches and smaller. So I put the water line to about right here. It's I would say a little bit more than a quarter of it, but because pond dries out so fast and it's super warm in my Redsta, I am not worried about it. I feel like I've pretty much answered all of the most frequently asked questions that came in about no drainage potting. The last thing that I wanted to touch on was the pros and cons of it in my experience. And while I do that, I am going to be repotting this big plowmanii because it is just, squished up against the edge of this pot. So let me get a little bit cleaned up here and um, I will get started. I'm gonna use one of these polypropylene Muji organizers for this plant because I'm trying to move all of my crawlers into these from what they're in right now. I repotted my Philodendron Gloriosum into one of these and it's actually doing really well. This actually has a hole in it, so I'm going to just be cutting a plastic sheet to size so that it can block it. Let's go into the pros and cons of no drainage potting. One of the pros of no drainage potting, which is kind of one of the main reasons why I started potting with no drainage was 
because I could see exactly what was going on inside of the substrate. Not only is it really fun to be able to see new roots, but in general, I feel like it's just easier for the plant to communicate with you that way. Um, you're not just relying on what the leaves look like or what the foliage looks like to tell you if it's thirsty or like what's going on down there. So that is definitely one pro if you're gonna be using vessels that are clear. You can see if you've got root rot, you can see if it's dry, you can see if it needs to be watered before the leaves start to get all wilty. And so besides that, I just find repots to be so much easier. Like this is what you work with when you're repotting with no drainage. It's like you're not dealing with pulling roots out of drainage holes. You're not it's just like everything is kind of there and all you have to do is like squeeze it and just kind of untangle it and you're done. So one of the things that I hate most about potting with drainage is repots. Especially if it's overdue for a repot, it's like it can be such a disaster. I've had plants in the past, specifically a Thai constellation, that was so root bound in its netted pot that I had to just chop away the bottom of the roots. I even tried chopping away at the pot itself and it was just a disaster. I had to like reroute. It was a whole thing. So that is definitely one perk of potting with no drainage is all your roots are intact and you don't have to worry about pulling it out of those drainage holes. I wanna take a picture of this, but I feel like Lekka is gonna get everywhere. I think I'm gonna try it. Whoa, ah, no. <laughs> oh my gosh, okay. I would say that the next pro of no drainage potting is that it just looks better. There's honestly nothing that I hate more than plastic pots. And if you're using cash pots, a lot of the times you're not going to be able to see through them. And then you have to, you actually have to like remove the pot from the vessel and just kind of see what's going on. There are a few plants that I have in plastic pots on my shelf that are in non-clear uh, cash pots and I just get so, I don't know, I just get so lazy to remove them just to see what's going on that I just eyeball the water and see if it's doing okay but it's just not my preference. I would much rather be able to see my roots and I don't know, I just find it to be really beautiful to be able to like not only enjoy the foliage of a plant like while it's in your space, but to, to also see what's going on underneath it because I just find that to also be such a nice thing to look at. Definite pro for me personally is that it just, it just looks a lot better and you can use glass and not use so much plastic. And then buying vessels at the thrift store are so much cheaper than buying like a plastic pot from the store. Sometimes it's even cheaper than buying those plastic pots that I've been using. One of my favorite things to do ever on a day where it's like a me day is I just go to the thrift store, I give myself a budget and I just stock up on new vessels. And even though like I have a good amount of vessels kind of like in my stock, it's just kind of nice to be able to have like backups and know that when something is ready to be sized up or a prop is ready to move that you've got a vessel ready for it. Um, I have repotted a lot of my plants in the last few weeks just because I have been filming like crazy so I am running slightly low on vessels and I'm definitely looking forward to the next time that I get to go back to the thrift store and restock. I'll probably make that a video too. In terms of maintenance, I actually find my plants with no drainage to be less work than my plants with drainage. Plants with drainage, it dries out really fast and if it doesn't have a cover pot, I have to make sure that there's either like a catch tray underneath it or I have to bring it to my sink to water it and I'm just really not about that life. I think if I only had like 10 or 15 plants, that would not be an issue at all. I have at least like 100 50 plants or something so it's just not feasible for me so to be able to just bring a sprayer over to my shelf and just get all of my watering done without having to actually move any of my plants it's pretty amazing so I yeah and because the the water kind of stays in the vessel a lot longer than my plants with no drainage I'm not watering as much 
and again being able to monitor those roots if you are going to be watering it a little bit more for the reserve you know you can start to see when a, a root is starting to look a little dark or look a little bit mushy and you can kind of alter your regimen from there and just make note like okay this plant does not like when it's got too much water sitting down at the bottom and I only have to water it when it's dry. So uh, a lot of it has to do with trial and error and observing your plants over a period of time. Not all plants will take to no drainage exactly the same way. You just kind of have to have the patience and take the time to really understand each of your plants and their habits. Yeah, that's a pro and it's a big pro for me just because I don't really have as much time as before to really just sit and be with my plants. I think that's one thing that I miss most about life before YouTube was that when I did plant care stuff, if I wasn't posting it on Instagram, it was really just for me and um, I could just, you know, spend a few hours just being with my plants and not really having to worry about filming but I do enjoy YouTube so there has been like a good trade-off yeah I just don't really have the time like I used to to just dedicate hours to watering on a certain day so moving a lot of my plants to no drainage has helped a lot with my schedule this chunk is huge well not huge but it's definitely longer than I thought it was I think another thing that I'd like to mention is that fertilizing has been uh, a little bit easier and lighter too. Because your fertilizer isn't draining out of the bottom of the pot, yes, people are worried about salt buildup and like over fertilization and stuff, but like I mentioned, I only fertilize at a quarter strength on non dormant plants. And so the fertilizer isn't going anywhere. It's in that vessel it's getting in your plant even though I am fertilizing more now meaning like I'm pretty much always fertilizing like on a weekly basis I'm using less fertilizer and my plants are still like thriving and doing really well so I also find fertilizing to be easier and then also I'm not having to use as much as before like I used to just blast through my bottles of Marfil because I think that the recommended strength is like one part Marfil to like 20 parts of water or something and that's kind of a lot especially if you're filling up a huge like eight liter jug I, I just find that my fertilizers are lasting a lot longer which is nice because they are very expensive and especially now with me really loving liquid gold leaf and using that and it's not available here in Canada, it's just nice that I've been able to stretch my fertilizers a little bit longer than it would have gone before when I didn't have as many plants in no drainage. I think I've covered all of the pros that I wanted to talk about, but now we can talk about the cons. The cons are that there is a little bit of a learning curve, not honestly, not too much. As long as your substrate is well aerated and you're giving your plant the conditions that it needs to photosynthesize and use the water that's in the vessel, it's really not a whole lot different unless you're the type of water that just runs it under the sink or something, which I'm not really a fan of just because it uses so much water when you just let like like that stream of water go through the pot and then go down the drain. I've never really done that with my plants just because I felt like it was a waste of water. So unless you are that kind of waterer, then yeah, there will be more of a learning curve. You'll have to like be very, very mindful with the amount of water you're using relative to the conditions you're giving it. Uh, another con is if you have a greenhouse or something. Honestly, if I had a greenhouse that I could just spray freely with a literal hose, I probably would have all of those plants with drainage so that I can free spray. So if you do have a greenhouse, or you have a tent that you free spray no drainage is probably not going to be for you because then there will be way too much water built up in those vessels it's really good if you're using it on a shelf like in your space or like a millsbo or a red star or something i do use no drainage in my exos but i'm not spraying so much in there that i would have to worry about like too much water being filled in my vessels i really just free spray in there um every few days because i like to foliar feed yeah that's a con if you if you're a really heavy waterer i guess and if you like to water with a hose then no drainage will probably not work for you i would say okay another con is if 
you don't have a lot of light in your space and you are not using a lot of grow lights, no drainage is probably not for you. The reason why I feel so confident with my no drainage vessels is because I know that the conditions I'm giving it are going to allow the plant to photosynthesize and use the water in the substrate. I do have a Raven ZZ in my husband's bathroom and that gets no light at all. The only light that plant gets is from the artificial light. <laughs> in the ceiling but it's been living in there for like probably close to eight months now and it's doing just fine but i don't water that one as often because there's not a lot a lot of light in there it's not using a ton of water it's not photosynthesizing a lot so it's it's really not using a ton of water and so i just adjust my watering accordingly and i only water when i see the plant is thirsty i will never leave it in um like a pool of water like ever again it's like knowing your conditions and knowing how much light your plants need to photosynthesize and use water um adequately i feel like if you're I feel like if your plants are not using water within like a week and a half, you probably want to take a look at your root system and see if it's healthy. Maybe add something like mycorrhizae because that helps with water retention and uh, taking in water in the plant. You might want to adjust how much light your plant is getting or adjust kind of the temperature conditions that it's in. My apartment is pretty warm. All of my greenhouses are very, very warm. So a lot of that water, if it's not being used by the plant, it's being evaporated. So no drainage potting has never really been an issue for me but in my areas where there's not as much light like in my office and in like the bathrooms and stuff i definitely will either choose to not use no drainage or i will just water very 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 sparingly all right so we've got a lot a lot of moss roots here and we have a pretty big stem and honestly i am very very tempted to cut this thing just because this amount of stem is already taking up so much space in this vessel. Like even if I could chop off just a tiny bit of it and then like clear up some space. But the thing is, is this plant is growing so well for me right now. And these leaves are actually getting very big. I don't really want to disturb the root system at the same time. I mean, I guess it still has a good amount of space to crawl. I've been trying to tell myself to stop chopping my plants so that I could let it live its best life, but this is a really long rhizome. Like I could chop this tail end off where it curves here and just go like that and it'll still have all of these roots. I would really only be chopping off Oh, actually, that's a lot of roots. Listen to your gut instinct. I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna do the same mixture that I did with my other vessel like this. I'm gonna do a small layer of Lekka down at the bottom and then fill the rest with aeroid soil. If this was a little bit higher, like this was a little bit deeper of a pot, I would have added maybe a little bit more Lekka, but since it's very shallow, um, I'm not gonna add too much just because this root system is quite large. But, uh, oh, I need to add some soil and I need myco. Believe it or not, this is all of the soil that I have left. I haven't bought a bag of soil since early last year. And that is because I constantly use old soil. I have a big, big batch of older soil that has been sifted of its amendments in my closet. And I slowly mix in like, um, like spoon, not spoonfuls, but like I'll scoop a little bit using something like this into the newer batch of soil and just mix it in. And I've been able to stretch my newer soil for a lot longer that way. And uh, yeah, I just like reusing it. I mentioned this in, where did I mention it? Was it a cute, no, 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 no. I, I mentioned this in my Instagram stories that just as a hobbyist, like I'm not working for a conservatory. I'm not growing plants for study. My plants in my house are purely for my own enjoyment. So I don't really feel like needing to use brand new soil every time is all that necessary. Like as long as my plants are showing me growth and they're happy, then I'm happy. And I know um, maybe some people might be like, oh, that's not good for your plants or you really shouldn't do that. Uh, my, my plants are fine. And uh, again, I'm not, not really giving back to the earth with my hobby. So it just 
for me it feels a little bit wasteful to just constantly be buying bags of soil so i just choose to save old soil reuse it with new soil and yeah i just i probably buy one bag of soil a year and we are getting close to that time so anywho i'm gonna try and spread these roots out a little bit throughout the vessel so that it's not just kind of clumped into one little area and i am going to put it at the very very edge of the pot so that it can have plenty of space to crawl i don't think i've mentioned this in this video but this is mycorrhizal inoculants i just apply this to the roots so sorry talking a little bit more about the cons i don't really know i think that might be it i don't know i really like no drainage potting so and the reason why I do no drainage potting so often is because I don't really find a ton of drawbacks once you really get used to it. It's almost like the same science as um, like terrarium growing. That's essentially the same concept. It's not draining into anywhere. You create like a little ecosystem in the vessel or the w whatever it's planted in. It's like a mini ecosystem. Oh, that's a chunk. <laughs> Look what I found, a little nugget. This looks like it could have been a Gloriosa or something. You'll notice that I have some really large chunks of charcoal in here. I don't actually put this in the soil. I just keep it, I just keep it inside of my containers with, um, with my soil. So I'm going to add my little rocks because this thing is leaning right over. And since I didn't do any chopping to this plant, I didn't chunk clean, I didn't really get in there, it was just a straight repot. I am going to be watering right away because I don't want these roots to dry out. But let's say if I chopped or something, then I, I would let it sort of callous up a little bit and let it kind of stay in a dry substrate for several hours. What is happening with this? Why is it leaning like that? Oh, okay. Well, this is just a weird plant. I did think of one other drawback as I was cleaning up and that is the picking out of the amendments when you mix substrates. So this was the, this is what I emptied my plowmanii into and I've got a bunch of like really fine moss here mixed in with LECA. So what I'm gonna do is pick out all of the LECA so that I can re-sterilize it. And then I will put this mixture of moss and per I'm not gonna pick out the perlite. No, I don't go that far. But I do have a bin of moss that's mixed with cocoa husk and perlite. So I will just add this to that mix and then call it a day. But I do have to sit here and pick out this LECA. So normally on a day like this where I do chores that I don't really like to do, I compile it all into one day and I just catch up on movies and shows and YouTube videos and I just sit here and I pick it out. And then by the end of it, my manicure is like completely ruined, but um, that's just, it just kind of comes with it. If you don't think that you can do this, like just sit here and save your amendments and pick them out, I would maybe just stick to using one substrate for your no drainage potting just because I would hate to like promote something like this and then people are just like throwing away LECA, throwing away pond, throwing away moss because they don't want to separate it out. So yeah, if you just know yourself enough and you know that you're not going to sit here and pick out amendments, probably either don't want to do no drainage or just don't mix the substrates. Alright guys, we are back to finally wrap up this video. I started editing it and it's it's long. I'm so sorry. I was really trying to make this as like quick as possible, but I just realized that there was so much more I wanted to talk about. Please ignore my box of laziness down there. Anyway, I just wanted to really quickly breeze through four plants that I worked on yesterday just to kind of show you. Hi, did you want to say hi? If you say hi, we gotta wipe your eyes. Hello everyone. Someone just wanted to say hi quickly. He was having FOMO. Such a sweetie. Is there anything you wanted to say? Oh, that's so sweet. They love you too. <laughs> they love you too. Oh, 
No, we're not gonna go to sleep right now. We're not gonna go to sleep right now. I gotta put you down. I'm sorry. Okay, say bye to all your friends. Bye friends, love you, see you next time. So like I was saying, I just wanna quickly breeze through four plants that I showed you yesterday. Uh, just to kind of show you the difference between when you first water and then when it's had a chance to take in water like overnight or over several hours. So the first one I'm going to show you is right behind me. It's the Hoya Abovada. She's definitely a lot plumper than she was yesterday. All of these leaves are super, super firm. Like yesterday, I could actually bend some of these a little bit, but now she's just like, nope, not me. But if you remember from earlier in this video, I did cover pretty much all of this perlite in water, if I can remember correctly. But now there is like nothing left in here. Like you can't even see a drop of water. So everything has moved its way into the soil and into the leaves. I am not going to be putting a reserve of water down here just because this soil is more dense and I don't want it really just sitting in like mucky soil so if it was something like leka and i had like a thicker layer of leka down at the bottom i probably would put like a teeny tiny bit but since we're only working with a little bit down here um i'm just going to leave it because this should stay pretty damp over the next week which is i water about once a week anyway so that's fine so yeah um moving on to the next plant just a refresher i filled it to about right here. The water line was a little bit higher, I believe. And now, now it's about down here. And these little straps are much firmer than yesterday. So I will, I'm not gonna be dumping out any of this water. I'm just gonna leave it and kind of let the plant take it as it needs. Some of it will evaporate. So I probably won't have to re-up this thing. I want to say, like, cause because pond dries out so fast, at least for me, I'm probably going to have to add water again in another, like, four or five days. Second to last one is the Philodendron Majestic. And if you can remember, I watered it through the Half Moon Moss Pole. And the water line was not much higher than it is right now. It was probably right about here. And now it's down to here, which is perfect because this one is in a greenhouse and I probably won't have to water this thing for probably a week or maybe like a week and a, a few days. But there is a new leaf coming, so it might use a little bit more water than it normally would. This level of water on a plant like this is ideal. This is where I would essentially like to keep it at all times. Also keep in mind that as your moss dries out, especially if you're submerging your moss in your substrate, it's gonna be taking in that water as well. So you might be depleting your water source even faster when you have a essentially a self-watering moss pole. This one yesterday was a lot more limp, but now you can see it's like really, really plumped up. It is harder to, to bend than yesterday. No more water left in here. I think if I can remember correctly, I probably left the water line to about here, but yeah, there is like, there's also not a drop of water left in here. So I could actually water this again and leave a little reserve down here. I would probably cover about half of it. Yeah, I uh, just kind of wanted to show you that like you shouldn't be afraid in your passive hydro vessels when you see water just sitting down at the bottom. I think a lot of people assume that you have to dump it out, but the soil knows what to do, your substrates know what to do, your plant knows what to do as long as you have healthy roots. Like if I had watered this as I did and I noticed that there was still a lot of water left like hitting the soil, I probably would dump out a little bit of it. But like I mentioned, once you do no drainage potting for a while, you just kind of... I swear you just know how much water to give it, especially if your plant is showing you exactly what it needs. If this, uh, if the soil was dry, but the leaves did not look dehydrated like it did yesterday, I honestly probably would have just watered it normally and then left a teeny tiny reserve at the bottom. I don't want to get too into my thought process because I don't want to overwhelm you and think there's like there should be like a flow chart and stuff. If I can leave you with anything today, it is get to know your plants before you move it to no drainage potting, understand your substrates and all the substrates you want to use or plan to use. 
um, just know their functions, know what they do for your plant. Start with a plant that is not very expensive. Maybe try like a pothos or something, something that you can just like easily take out of a big basket and just kind of experiment with it first and just overall like observe the conditions you're giving it and and see how the plant reacts to being in no drainage. But again, I am uh, just, I just wanna remind you, this video is not to tell you that this is the way to pot. I, I still have a good amount of plants with drainage holes. I use both, but I do really heavily tend to do no drainage for all of my aeroids. But anyway, I hope you guys found this video helpful. I hope that I was able to touch on most of the frequently asked questions, but of course, if you have more questions, just leave it down in the comments and I will reply to them individually. I don't really plan on doing a part three if a lot of questions come in just because I feel like I have over exhausted this topic and after refilming this video twice I'm just kind of over it to be honest so um, if anything if a good amount of questions do come in I might include it maybe in a Q&A during a repot like I'll do a no drainage potting repot Q&A if that makes sense but otherwise that is it for me on this topic if you guys like this video please give it a thumbs up because it helps pudgeonize visibility a lot on YouTube thank you to everyone who has been here thank you to all the new subscribers thank you for all of the love all of the support and I will see you in the next one